that my session this time. Uh, my name is Sakuro. I work for SAP. Um, so the January session is something we started in uh, 2006, which was sort of intended to be something that you have a conference, an expert meeting, uh, where we set specific themes and invite uh, artists, and researchers, and theorists to uh, talk about their work. Um, and uh, this time we're collaborating with the Sonic Arts Festival. Uh, and uh, I thought it was a good opportunity to host one of these sessions again. So um, part of our collaborations was to invite two artists um, that work with sound, music, and uh, installation. And we had them come here for three weeks and uh, work on their pieces um, uh, that will be shown during the festival. Um, so the first half of this session is going to be two presentations, one by Hans W. Koch, who has an installation here in this building in two rooms, uh, which uh, you'll get to see later on during the lunch break. And then uh, after Hans, we'll have Yutaka Makino, uh, who's doing a performance uh, every day uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday at the Melkweg. Um, so I'm going to have them talk a little bit about their work and also the pieces they made. After that, we'll have a lunch break, uh, and then we'll come back with the second session, um, which I'll introduce later on. So I'll pass it on to Hans. I was told I should speak in this direction. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm still addressing you. Um, so my name is Hans W. Koch, and I got this invitation, which I have to thank the Steiner really for, to develop an installation here for the Sonic Arts Festival. Um, and I think I'm, my talk will be two things now. I, first, I talk a bit in general about what I'm doing as an artist, and then I talk about the installation. And uh, it's already running here, so during lunch break, if you've eaten enough and drank enough and talked enough, you can have a look at it or a listen at it, as you wish. Um, I would like to start the talk actually with not talking, but showing a short video clip um, with the work I did a couple of years ago, which I in a way is emblematic for the, uh, for the way I'm dealing with things. It's a very simple setup, as you see, it. Um, and uh, it's uh, those two hair dryers. What uh, isn't obvious on the on the image? They are not controlled by any circuitry. They are running on their own. With they have uh, hair dryers have this built-in heat protection. So if you put something on the exit of the hair dryer, the hot air gets stuck, and it, the thing heats up, so it shuts down. Then it cools, and it's completely running randomly every one, one and a half hour approximately, the two guys meet or don't miss each other. Um, I said that it's a bit uh, 
it's like a, a token for what I'm doing is because I'm, I, I like to use the simple ideas. I'm kind of a simple minded guy and take things literally. Like I, I, I'm looking around in, in everyday tools in uh, how they function and then I try to transport it in the context of my artwork by things which are usually overlooked. Um, another example of this is uh, the way I started working with computers. Is um, I come from Cologne and I studied composition there, so that's my background at the Music Academy. And there was a lot of talk about computer music in Cologne, it still is, of course. Um, and whenever I saw some of the pieces, I always had the idea they're actually not talking about uh, computer music, they're talking about software music, which I consider uh, a slight difference between the two things. So what interested me was uh, how does a computer actually sound when you're not running software on it? Or when the main focus is not using a software? And the only way to do that was uh, take a computer and open it up and check what, what sound is in it. No, I didn't. So I did a piece where it just did that. Um, I have to kind of put that off, put that on. So this is a, an old Pentium. It's motherboard and it's actually booted. And uh, the whole thing you're gonna see it just lasts one minute, it's time compressed. Uh, uh, in reality, it lasts like 15 minutes, but uh, I don't wanna, in German you say time shin, Zeit shin, like squeezing, <laughs> because we all wanna have lunch break. So at the end, the thing is dead. <laughs> oh, because it doesn't like what you do to it. But uh, it's the only way of getting out this sound out of the computer. And, uh, it was a time when I didn't have a computer myself to write texts on it. So, uh, but I wanted to have one for making music with it. And so it, uh, this evolved into somehow using computers in more elaborate ways because uh, you cannot always have one which you can kill. Um, I started learning to work with computers in a more ordinary way, but I was still interested in this relation between the computer as a combination of software and hardware. Uh, Everybody is always complaining about computers being too slow and uh, being uh, only they can, cannot handle what I'm doing as software, but I see them as, as kind of a unity. So uh, another piece I did with it's always confusing with two screens. Um, taking my laptop, which has this um, built-in microphone and loudspeaker, and if you try to use both, for example, opening up a help, a help, a help patch in Max MSP, you have a feedback, great. Uh, it's, it's totally annoying. And especially with one series of the Apple PowerBooks, they made it so close to, to, to each other that it uh, was barely unusable, almost unusable. Um, 
But the thing which annoyed me so much uh, then made me think if I cannot profit from it. So I programmed something. Meanwhile, I had learned a bit to deal with MaxMSP, which acts as a filter for that feedback, which I can control with the keyboard. And it was uh, the birth of Bandonion book, as I call it. It's a way to play the laptop like an accordion. <laughs> As I open and close the lid, I change the space of that feedback, so that changes the volume. and so on and so on. Um, so that's, um, I like to take things literally, like uh, see what is in a certain term. And now it gets a bit more theoretical. Um, I don't know how many of you play an instrument or know something about music theory. Okay, I see from the faces that <laughs> I shouldn't go too deep into that. Um, there is this thing in, in Western music which is called the circle of fifths, which means you have, you probably have heard, all heard about it, you have the 12 pitches, it's the 12 keys on the, on the keyboard of a piano, for example, then it starts repeating. And in music theory, they are sorted in a special way. You take, you start with the C, like if you imagine a clock, and you go around the clock, on top is the C, then you go five notes, then comes the G, that makes the interval of a fifth. Then you go again five notes, you arrive at the D, and if you go make the, the full circle, um, you are uh, back to the C again. It took them centuries to figure that out, that it really matches at the end, but with around the time of Bach, they finally arrived there. And this kind of describes a virtual space in music, which means every melody travels within that space. You can easily think if you have like a simple melody going from C to D, you already skip one in that circle, so you're hopping around in that circle with your music. But that's something which interests more theorists, theorists of music, and if you listen to some piece, you're never gonna think about that. But uh, there was a point when I thought it's actually an interesting concept for specialization. So I wanted to find out ways to, uh, to transport the virtual space of music theory into a real space. And what I did, I, I uh, developed a filtering process which can filter out individual pitches from like an orchestra recording so, at the, for example, you take a piece by Mozart, and at the end I have 12 audio tracks, and each audio track only has one pitch. On one are all the, the Cs of the orchestra, on the other one are all the Gs, and so, so on, and you put them up in a circle, and if you stand in the middle of the circle, you hear the piece as you would hear it normally, but you can move your head around, 
And if you get very close to one speaker, you only hear beep, 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 beep coming out because you only hear that one pitch. And everything in between them, there are shifts in perception. Um, uh, since we don't have 12 loudspeakers here, it would be a big hassle to set it all up. Um, I'm going to make a short demonstration of that. Demonstration works in a way that I start with one pitch, bring in the second pitch, and the third pitch, and so on, until we have the 12 pitches, and you can hear the full piece. <coughs> that's how it was set up. So you can see that's the clock. You can step into the circle. Oh, actually, I should put up the volume. Otherwise, we won't have much of it. The film isn't very interesting in itself, it's more about Okay. Yeah. Now I'm going to uh, switch to just talking <laughs> uh, and talk about the piece I did for this time here. I started out from the idea, it's actually, you probably know from your childhood, uh, when, when you first start looking at the mirror and you think about what, what's behind this mirror, there's this guy, I was left and he was right and that's uh, something uh, Lewis Carroll wrote a book about it, Behind the Looking Glass. And it's some, an idea which has kind of stuck in my mind for a long time without... Uh, uh, I'm working mostly with sound, so I, it's not easy to find a way to work in that area with sound. So when this time asked me uh, to do something here and I came here to see the space because I had never been here before, uh, one of the great things they showed me was when this time was built 30 years ago here, they wired up every room together with every room and created the patch bay so you can hook up a microphone on the third floor and have a loudspeaker on, 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 the, uh, on the ground floor and then talk into it and it, it works. Fantastic. And I had this idea of trying to create kind of an acoustic mirror. On a, an optical mirror, you have like a vertical axis, left, 
gets right and right gets left. And I was thinking about means, how I could do that with acoustics. And so I had this idea of trying to develop uh, a horizontal mirror which would flip frequencies, that high frequencies become low frequencies and low frequencies become high frequencies. And that's uh, what I actually tried to do here, or, or kind of did. Um, and I also wanted to preserve this idea that you have, when you have a mirror, you see another space in that mirror. So I have, uh, that's why it's called two rooms flipped the installation. I have two spaces here. One is the studio one here on the ground floor, and the other one is the space on the third floor. And they are connected to each other. Uh, each room contains a microphone and a, a loudspeaker. And what you hear, what, you, uh, what, what is produced, the sound in one room, is mirrored in the other room, and vice versa. So it's actually like uh, not only one mirror, but like um, this uh, kind of mirror cabinets, which you sometimes have for entertainment and fairs or so. And it also is uh, on, on the edge of feedback. It's like an optical feedback transported into audio where it's more commonly used. And it, I wanted to kind of uh, preserve the image of that. So I did some visual hookup for that too, for that idea, which you can see later. So if you go into that room and for example, whistle a melody, you have another guy who whistles the melody back at you, but if you go like up with your melody, the, the guy goes down. And as a kind of, uh, since not everybody uh, wants to whistle and it's not necessary actually, there's a kind of a handrail in that installation which is just a slowly gliding tone which glides up in one room, glides down in the other room, and you hear them both in the one room but mirrored transported down from the other room. It's something uh, like in a real mirror, it's not easy to get in that room behind, unless you're Alice from Lewis Carroll. So you cannot be in both rooms at the same time. You really have, would have to jump up and down. That's why I kind of bring out that sound there too. Did this make myself clear? <laughs> Um, that is actually what I wanted to say about it. Now I'm running out of ideas. If anybody got a question, that would be helpful now. Did you not think of working with backward sound, with reversible sound? Um, the thing with a reversible sound is uh, in order to reverse it in real time, because I wanted to do it in real time, you would have to predict the future which my computer can't. <laughs> so <laughs> it's uh, more out of practical concerns. I thought about that, but <laughs> <laughs> Max isn't that far <laughs> evolved. <laughs> and it's also... Um, I mean, these distortion mirrors, they kind of uh, make you look a bit monsterish or nicer, depending on who you are in front of the mirror. Um, this, the, the mirror I made also uh, distorts. And this has some, uh, not only aesthetic decisions, but also some practical reasons. The, and now it gets very tacky, probably. So I won't go too, too deep into that. Uh, if you just fool the frequencies with uh, a simple process, you end up with a very high-pitched noise where all the frequencies are compressed. And, and it sounds less pleasant than even I would want. So I took mathematical means to stretch that out a bit that it gets more into what we can perceive. This has to do with uh, the way uh, our ear functions, the frequencies are sorted logarithmically, which means they get more compressed in the higher range. The steps are closer together there. So uh, I'm stretching that a bit that you can actually follow the process more, more precisely, which means the image is not the truth. It's 
It's, that's why I call it this distortion mirror cabinet. I'm curious whether um, you would be able to make this piece uh, instead of two spaces in the same building if you think it translates to uh, an internet piece, for example, or not at all, and how you see um, You could do it, actually. It's, uh, I, I, I know, there's... of course, you could do it, but, I mean, in terms of your piece, would it, how much does it matter that you walk up the stairs and see another one here in another space and come down? Um... It could be even a space on the ground floor, but I'm quite happy that it, it is not, because uh, I want to have this uh, real physical distance between the two spaces, which makes it impossible to experience the two spaces at the same time. Um, they are a mirror of each other, but uh, like Alice in this story, she can either decide to be in front of the mirror or slide into that other land behind the mirror, but you can't be in both spaces. And of course the internet would be a very good medium for that too, except if you make like an iPhone app out of it and you have two people sitting in the pub together. But something occurs to me, if you, uh, I'm just thinking about optical equivalence. If you give somebody a pair of glasses that inverts the image so they see things upside down, mm -hmm. after a while, brain gets used to it, because it anyway sees things upside down, mm -hmm. so it's perfectly good at turning things the other way, and people start to be able to read the world. I'm wondering whether there might be a, an acoustic equivalent that you might actually, if you were really getting feedback that was your, say, your own voice, but with the yeah. reverse, whether you would have a similar effect of an adjustment, you'd be, begin as it were to read um, the world upside down. It's... It's quite difficult after sitting many hours and just doing that and trying to figure out that I um, I got an idea that it could work, uh, but it would take a longer time. I have I've done this experiment at, in some exhibition where they passed through these these Googles to, to to flip, and it doesn't take so long as, as I think it would take with the acoustics. Um, it's probably because also, our culture is so much visually based that we are easier, more easily dealing with that stuff and the brain. Uh, whereas all this auditory stuff is, is connected more to deeper layers, I think. And that's harder to recode in the brain. I mean, it would be an interesting experience, probably quite annoying. <laughs> <laughs> to sit there for days and see if people start uh, speaking with full frequency. <laughs> but it could come close to torture. Yes. Uh, I saw that uh, your work has to do a lot with the space, of course, and uh, visual also. It's, it's, it's very visual. At least the pieces we've seen here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also you mentioned now literature. And then I wonder... Uh, yeah, what's your, uh, if you have references uh, very clear in these other fields uh, outside the uh, music itself, and uh, what's your relation with it? Um, um, yeah. I'm not, not sure if I completely understand the question. You want uh, me to name references for my work? Or um, if you have even a background uh, formally in these other fields, I'm just wondering. Um, I mean, uh, it's. Uh, I've done. A, I've studied a lot of different things in my life, including hieroglyphs and cuneiforms, <laughs> and hieroglyphs and cuneiforms, and uh, physics and history, and, and, and so. Uh, and I like a lot reading stuff. Um, there was a time when I was uh, very involved with. Um, Radical constructivism, Heinz von Förster, those guys. Um, but mostly, I see myself as a, uh, coming from a musical background more than from a visual arts background. Um, and so, a lot of my stuff makes references also to music or acoustical phenomena. And of course, I'm. 
in depth to John Cage and all the, those guys. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Yeah? yeah. Hmm. I'm, I wasn't sure. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, why don't we um, make the transition? Yes. Us, uh, you know, um, I've been working at time for this installation or performance piece for about a month now. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, my background, also the concept or the process of my work for this uh, festival, also uh, my work in general. Um, this is a text by composer Edgar Varese in 1950, ah, sorry, 1937. It's called New Instrument and New Music. Um, this, I'm showing this because this was kind of quite inspiring text for me when I started making my work. Um, so I just let you read this text for maybe a minute or two. So after I read this text, I was kind of wondering what will be the new instrument for my generation or me as an artist. Um, I mainly use a computer for my work, and I was kind of thinking about how I can make uh, my computer as a new instrument for all my works. Um, the word computer, um, is the word compute, which consists of two words, it's from Latin, it's com and pitar. Scom means together, and pitar means to think. So the idea of this computational uh, medium for me is not just about using computer, but about how I create a system which consists of tiny little parts work together as a whole. So for me, it's computer is not just uh, the machine calculate something, but I'm more interested in how to make computer more uh, independent system to work with, not to just ask to do some specific work. So I kind of slowly developed the idea, which consists of three criteria, which is the those three. Um, it's not, I mean, started as a top-down strat strategy to compose music, but to kind of shift the towers, it's called the bottom-up or tactical, um, which means that the, uh, so that's uh, just I mentioned, the word computer, which is kind of small parts work together as a whole. So not just controlling each particle, but kind of controlling entire system tendency. And not just, and the second one, it's, it's not just a form, but formation or information, um, also self-formation. This idea actually came from uh, German architect Fry Otto. He was the quite famous structural engineer of architecture of 20th century. Um, he built um, Munich Olympic Stadium, which kind of he used the salt bubble to calculate or design the whole stadium. So I was quite in inspired by this kind of idea of the use, kind of materialize the behavior of those materials, which is not tactile material. And the third one is for making, like a shifting towers form finding. It's not about kind of creating specific form you have in your mind, but I'm, I was more interested in how I can find a form in different type of, of phenomena. So with these three criteria, what I was looking for is emergent properties such as sonority form patterns, which I use this for my work to compose music, make sculpture, make installation, or make system for the installation. So these three criteria or three properties could be referred as behaviors. So my interest is 
it's kind of create not sound specific or visual specific, but I'm kind of creating behavior which could be translated into sound or form or systems. So, so, and then where you can find those behaviors, it's quite everywhere, of course. So the naturals are those kind of phenomena, thunderstorm or tornado or another tornado. So um, my background is actually not the fine arts. My background is earth science and environmental science. Kind of always I refer my work to those type of phenomena in nature. Um, but not, my interest is not validating my work with those scientific phenomena or mathematics. So once Dan Graham, the concept chart is Dan Graham mentioned this short sentence, which is quite um, understandable for me. <clears throat> so I use those idea came from natural systems or social systems to kind of abstract uh, in a way that's, that I can use it for my work. So the abstraction itself is really embedded in my work in general. So the environment is this I kind of divided two, three categories um, to kind of express the emphasis of my works. The, one of them is called the environment. So the word environment kind of idea came from uh, composer Ernie Prasar. So I'm trying to make environment which is, in a way, it's neutral, where you can find your own uh, narratives or ideas of, or interpretations, not just kind of enforcing specific experience to spectators. I rather free spectators to let them experience um, from with their experience or their history or their narratives. So the new work called the Conflux is for this festival is linked to this idea of environment. So as a practice, I'm, I'm, I've been working with called the wave field synthesis system in a couple of different uh, countries. Uh, this is a new type of um, kind of spatializing sound or spatial sound systems um, in Germany in, here in Holland, also when in California in the States. This is the first work I did with this type of system in 2008 at the International Guardian Music Week. So I was interesting not about this kind of typical French tradition of electroacoustic diffusion. I'm not interested in that type of spatialization. I'm rather interested in how I can abstract the space with sound or abstracting space and redefining the space itself, not about the movement of sound of objects. So for this installation, I use the wave field to create kind of wave of sound which kind of uh, realized by complex phase interaction of each sound from speakers. So what you hear is actually not the movement of sound, but kind of wave of sound coming, coming towards you and penetrate you and it disappears. So this system is created by a foundation game of life based in uh, Leiden. And you, you can see this concert at this festival too. I'm not sure about the uh, dates of the concert, but um, you can check the problem. To experience this work, um, spectators can sit in the middle of speaker array. And now I'm residing in Berlin, Germany, where I, I, I will work with TU Berlin, Technical University of Berlin. They built the same type of uh, systems last, they finished this three years ago, I think. Uh, those gray panels are all speakers. You can see as this. These are 2,700 speakers, um, 800 independent channel uh, sound system. So I'm going to work with this system uh, from next month. 
And the last one is based in California. It's called PLACO, the California Nano Systems Institute. This system is still under development. Infrastructure just finished three years ago. Uh, they're currently working on uh, building a pole sound system and visual projection systems. So this sphere actually located in like a three-story high and an echoic chamber. And you can see this projection. Now it's, there's only two projections, but the Indians will cover the entire sphere so you can totally immerse with individual field. Also sound will be uh, installed on the surface of sphere. So it's a total uh, audiovisual immerse, immersive space. And there's a video. Oops. It's computer died. This, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, not about spatializing sound or spatializing anything, but redefining space or recreation of space. Um, so I tend to use space, but I change to use, start using it's called environment. Um, this American uh, psychologist uh, called James Jerome Gibson, he mentioned the word space doesn't um, actually involved in his, in his type of spectatorship. So the, he's suggesting that the word environment is about uh, interaction between spectators and its surrounding. So I tend to start using this idea of environment. So the work uh, actually I'm making for this festival, it's called Complex, is about, it came from the, my, my three criteria, also the idea of the environment. Um, I'm hoping to show you some photos, but still starting out. So um, I think if, I'm not sure you guys read the description of my work. Uh, it's it's a performance of lights, sound, and the fog. But it's all about um, my conception was how I can kind of create a um, new type of space with this behavior of fog, not about the lights or fog or uh, sound itself, but I'm interested in how I compose behavior which defines the space or environment itself. So environment creates this behavior of fog, but everything is linked together. So you can't really separate just the sound or fog or light. So everything as exists as one whole, as the environment. So now I think I can show you some. Maybe I shouldn't discover all the details, how it works or not, but i just give you some hints. I'm a strongly suggest if you have time to come, please come to experience my work. It's not about the visual or audio work, so you need to really experience it then. So there's a two different temperature of fogs coming out. So the, the, the room temperature is really uh, kind of, the temperature will be alternated by the spectators, their body heat and everything. So the, the higher ceiling with the cloud is slowly coming down, depends on the air condition of the room. The bottom layer of the smoke is going to go up with your body temperature. So slowly merge and create, um, oops, here. It's complete whiteout. So it's a really slow piece. Um, it might take, it depends on the body temperature of spectators, also room temperature, or which day it's humidity. It's, there's no solid structure, it's a live performance. I'm hoping that you can come and you, you experience might be different, but um, yeah, I hope you guys can come and experience this work. Um, this is the end of my presentation. You should tell them it's a different kind of prison. Exactly, <laughs> thanks. Um, so it's announced as a 6 p.m. and a 7 p.m. show, but uh, there's uh, some problem with noise pollution for uh, the venue. So my piece was moved 1 p.m. and 2 p.m on Friday and Saturday. The Sunday, it's gonna be 3 p.m. and 4 p.m. Uh, you need to make a reservation since this room only can 
uh, fit uh, eight people. So eight people for six shows means about 50 people can experience. It's a really limited amount of time and people. But you can make a reservation at the Valley's information desk. Um, or, I don't know, is any other alternative reservation? No? Okay. So please go to the Valley, make your reservation, and hope to see you there. Thanks. So just Taku one mention about my other work. Um, so this is a sculpture I made um, two years ago, which basically um, I created virtual environments inside of the 3D software. So basically, this idea came from exactly the same. Um, so small particles flying around this virtual environment. You create a different type of force field, which is, could be wind or gravitational field, or, diff or combination of everything. Or you can also apply as an abstract form, which is not exactly gravitation, but close. So I applied a different type of force field into this a point cloud. It's like a cloud in the sky. So slowly shape, shaping their kind of um, distribution. So this is the kind of how I made this sculpture. It's not really the shape I expected, but I found in this constant or continuous uh, reformation or constant uh, flux of uh, particles. Is it, uh, is it a stable uh, sculpture or is it a snapshot of a constant flux? Um, this one was the first I captured it, so mm -hmm. freezed the mm -hmm. situation. Uh -huh. So this one was uh, printed out as a 3D sculpture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the system itself would be constantly shifting. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I, I never get exactly the same shape again, but might get no way better, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and other work. Um, my compositional work also uh, utilizes exactly the same idea of how um, different type of uh, point cloud system, how I, they distribute in the space. I kind of, it's really hard to explain, but uh, I'm interested in how kind of compose the behavior, as I said before. So I take out this idea of systems to create my sound pieces in at, in the end become comp uh, composition. Um, it's idea also is, is common in 50s uh, computer music such as Herbert Brin or Xenakis or uh, Koenig, he's a German composer also. Um, so basically they're uh, constructing the piece from the one sample which is smaller than waveform. So sm slowly cons constructing sample into waveform, into small section, into whole composition. So I'm quite inspired by those ideas, creating uh, bottom-up into whole new work. So it's in my role as a composer, it's not just giving order to my machine, but kind of always conversational procedure to complete my compositions. So that applies to sculpture, applies to uh, installations too. Um. 
I wondered if you could say something about uh, using fog and if you've used it before in other pieces or if you um, have a reference to other works by other artists who use fog. Uh, it should be like a, more than hundreds of artists use fog, so it's not really special material for, uh, for I mean, in general. But um, so I, I've been using this cloud system in in computational mean, but uh, my interest is um, it's composing uh, behavior or composing the environment which causes uh, fog's behavior, uh, which kind of also applies to the way sound is generated in general in my compositions. Of course, my, I was really fascinated by uh, Anton Gomley's uh, installation two years ago at the Hayward Gallery also. Also, there's a tons of reference Hans gave it to me. There's many other artists working with fog. But the fog is not really my issue, but the, my issue is its the behavior, how we can perceive it. So fog is material which I can still perceive its behavior, and it's quite diverse. It's not just using a computation mean, which I can create many times, but the fog is really ephemeral. It's easy to dis disperse into the space. So I had this kind of fragility of material. I was quite interested, and it's abstraction. Uh, it's really abstract material, which you can have no control almost. So I'm still kind of, it's just always a dialectical relation to its environment and myself as an artist, also spectator and environment itself, I think. Um, the the Fabian uh, complex is uh, uh, influenced by, uh, by the people in the space, always going to be different. Is the, the sound and the light also um, So because the lights emit a lot of heat, so light is also part of the way uh, compose the behavior. Of course, it's it's create the really white out, but also create the flow of heat. It's going from bottom to up, and create the circulation too. So every single time will be different because I ca I don't have 100% control of the fog. It's behavior. I don't have a 100% spectator spectator either. So the item just let them uh, go. Up. So I, I have no expectation to specific movements or events. Yeah. But, but how, about, how about the sound? Is it pre uh, pre-composed? It's, everything is uh, live. Okay. So every single time it will be different. Depends on temperature. <laughs> Any other questions? What, uh, what material is the fog? Is it just water vapor or is there anything It's a, uh, I could have used water vapor but uh, it's a, actually an artificial fog. Uh, artificial has long-lasting um, capability, so it's a hand longer than water vapors. So you can see the details more clearly. Any other questions? Comments? Yes. I've just been thinking about you know, the, the, the principal characteristic of fog and why it's so strange, just in ordinary life, and mm -hmm. also often very frightening, um, which is that it, it both does and doesn't exist. Um, because it exists as particles, mm -hmm. but that's not what we mean by a cloud. What we mean by a cloud is the particular kind of illusion produced by the effect of aggregation, which depends on us not being in it. Mm -hmm. Because if you're in it, you really don't see it. I mean, the, the Anthony Gormley piece mm. is almost entirely uniform. Yes. You're in the fog, you're just in it, you're just, and you don't know where you are. Um, your piece, you seem to be interested in being in it and also being, to some degree, outside of it, so you can begin to see a form exactly. um, emerging. So the piece is kind of, you become, uh, first you kind of, examine or you can perceive entire movement of the crown is slowly you're uh, in this whole, whole cloud of white out. Um, interesting about the, this dif uh, this transition of perception, the first you perceive is the patterns on the cloud. They, when you get completely white, you start generating pattern into the space because you have no depth information, you kind of start projecting your patterns into this white out field. 
So I'm an interesting kind of transition of perceptual state into from beginning to the end of my piece.